first thanking the UCLA Law School for hosting this event and also thanking our uh, multiple co-sponsors of the event, the, the Critical Race Studies Program here at UCLA Law School, the Von Grunebaum Center for Near Eastern Studies here at UCLA, the Islamic Studies Interdepartmental Program, and the Journal of Islamic and Near Eastern Law are all co-sponsors of this lecture today. Um, we are very, very privileged to have Professor Khalid Abu Fadl here at UCLA at the law school. He is perhaps the leading authority in the English language on Islamic law and among the leading authorities in the world in any language on the subject that he's going to address today. Professor Abu Fadl was awarded the University of Oslo Human Rights Award in 2007 for his lifetime contribution to the field of human rights. And he was also named a Carnegie Scholar in Islamic law in 2007. As many of you know, and indeed I'm giving a very truncated introduction because Professor Abu Fadl needs no introduction here at UCLA or indeed in, in most other audiences in the world, he teaches Islamic jurisprudence here, international human rights, and political asylum at the law school, and he is also the chair of the UCLA Islamic Studies Interdepartmental Program. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Abu Fadl, and we'll join you again during the question answer period, which I am delighted to moderate. Professor Abu Fadl. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, I'll start first with the idea for um, uh, this talk and what hopefully will become a series at UCLA. Um, it's uh, people like myself, they're accustomed to. Um, specializing in what for most for the most part and most of the time is fairly esoteric field of discourse um, we uh, or field of study we uh, spend countless hours reading um, texts written uh, centuries ago uh, deciphering uh, contingent language, symbolic language, um, uh, texts that have layers of meaning um, and various historical contextual contingencies and so on and uh, quite often working with manuscripts that have not been published and sort of uh, it's, a, it's rarely um, something sexy. Uh, or particularly uh, 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 it's exciting for me but it's, it's really exciting for uh, people who um, uh, do not relish uh, medieval legal discourses and um, so on. So it's an odd, to say the least, it's, uh, it's rather an odd position to suddenly find Sharia jumping into uh, a, a public discourses in the West and in a particular way um, that uh, it, it, it truly calls for a reflective moment upon one's work and uh, one's means of discourse. Uh, anyone, I don't know how many of my the students who take, who take uh, my Islamic class are here, but my graduate students and students who take the Islamic law course that I teach here or every once in a while I teach advanced Islamic law, you know, the one thing they'll immediately tell you is that it's hardly uh, a, a field full of... Um, exciting and enthralling moments. It's a field full of technicalities and um, uh, archaic arguments and some modernistic attempts to reformulate and reconstruct arguments, etc., etc. And yet, that shift from the, which is something I'm going to talk about in, in greater detail, the academic discourse on a tradition to a a, a largely symbolic discourse uh, about that same tradition but from a decidedly different vantage point is um, uh, 
a bit of a of a, a, a psycho- an odd psychological and intellectual shift. You know, in, in uh, some ways, you can imagine um, a, a, an expert in Roman law, uh, where suddenly Roman law becomes uh, the hot topic of the day, and people are talking about uh, whether Roman law is good or bad. Um, you know, it's an odd question, to say the least. Uh, or, and uh, quite often, and this unfortunately is documented, uh, the, uh, specialists in rabbinic tradition um, doing the uh, crazy events and Islam, uh, anti Semitic environment leading up to World War II, where these sort of scholarly, bookish figures. Uh, accustomed to dealing in nuance and sub-nuance, uh, suddenly are confronted by a, a discourse that has uh, very little use for nuance and very little uh, use for um, uh, uh, details or for reality at all. Because it's a discourse where the, the, the legal system is not the intended subject of the study, it's really a, the symbolic role that the legal system plays, or what the legal sim, uh, system symbolizes in um, popular imagination. Now, of course, in this context, uh, many students and others, um, interestingly enough, um, even some people from um, uh, from government and so on, you say, well, you know, the, your your field is you, the hot item. Uh, it's at the forefront. Everyone is talking about Sharia, and um, uh, you're a Sharia authority. Uh, where are you? Um, we haven't heard you say anything. And I confess to my students and to them that um, it is difficult to phrase an, uh, an academic or scholarly or scholastic discourse in a environment where scholasticism is the, uh, uh, the last thing that people have on mind. I'll, bring this closer to mind in, in a variety of ways, but for instance, one of the uh, uh, notable and, and uh, interesting phenomena is that my Islamic law course, or Islamic law courses, definitely drew a larger crowd uh, before 9-11 generally, but a decade after 9-11, uh, those taking Islamic law, or those, especially non-Muslims, uh, who are st- interested in studying Islamic law in a systematic and academic fashion, uh, has decreased, not increased. And in fact, um, by comparing class this year to my class 10 years ago, uh, the a reduction is about 50%, 50% less students, especially non-Muslim students. And even, you know, I feel sorry for some of the students who sign up because they, they, they sign up uh, thinking they will either have their identity affirmed or their beliefs confirmed, and they find that at the end neither happens, but the world just gets far more complicated. Um, it, now, it, it's quite fascinating that as supposedly there is a demand for information about Sharia, and definitely uh, there are uh, people who've uh, created a career out of, quote unquote, some type of claim over Sharia expertise, uh, that you find at the same time. Uh, uh, venues for academic discourses on Sharia has decreased. Uh, again, a point of comparison, uh, the number of invited lectures on uh, Islamic law post 
before 9-11 and right after 9-11 were much, much higher than they are today. Uh, if there is, uh, quite often, if there is a sponsored lecture, um, and I'm here referring to prestigious named lectures, not uh, uh, community-sponsored lectures. Uh, if, the, if there are uh, that type of invitation, usually the interest uh, is in a speaker that reflects a certain ideological orientation, whether whatever label you put on that ideological orientation, reformer, moderate, secularist, um, uh, etc., etc., which again, from an academic perspective, is uh, highly problematic. You, it, it's already a bad lecture if you can predict um, uh, the, uh, uh, how the scholar will analyze the desperate pieces of evidence uh, and raw material that they deal with. Um, that's just bad scholarship. Uh, a, a, a good scholarship is uh, you, uh, the scholar takes you in an investigatory journey where uh, you sort of, where you end up is an is a enriching and enlightening and exciting and so on and so forth. Now, there are reasons that I'm going to talk about, uh, about specifically about the history of and, and the battle over authority, legitimacy, um, uh, 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 and academia especially, uh, over who gets to speak for Sharia and what to say about Sharia in the West. Uh, there is a history there, and it's a history that is quite interesting, and it's a history that informs much of what uh, is going on today. Uh, in, in, in the, the, the sort of moral barrier between those who deal with Sharia or uh, more generally with Islam, Islamic history, Islamic theology, but more specifically Sharia as Islamic law, those who deal with it from an academic scholarly perspective and those who deal with it as a, an ideological symbolic point, uh, there has been a, a, a consistent moral and intellectual barrier between the two, which in some key ways uh, is, we're finding is being breached and is uh, de de uh, disintegrating um, in the current environment. I'll, I'll tie this in. Well, first question, really, in, in terms of having a Sharia expert in the midst of this frenzy of um, self-appointed experts, um, uh, uh, Sharia constantly being in, in the airways and so on, is uh, does do or do the popular discourses, do the discourse, do the lay discourses matter? This is sort of the flip question. Normally we ask, do the elitist academic discourses matter? Do they make any difference? Well, here the question that I have to confront is, well, many academics tend to look at the lay discourses, the, the, the symbolic discourses, the social discourses, as beneath them, as um, sort of what, as a passing moment of history of no real consequence and no lasting impact, and in a, in a typical academic fashion to think of what, uh, of what does have a staying power and what is significant is true research and scholarship. So the book published by Cambridge Press sold for close to $100 uh, will be in the library for decades to come is far more important than uh, the book that is placed in Barnes & Noble or Borders that is selling for 20 bucks and that is selling thousands of copies and to, as one uh, academic friend of mine just recently said, uh, you know, these have their moments but then they 
uh, swept away 